We're going to start the study tonight on the Bible doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We are using Brother Robert Taylor's book as kind of a guidebook to this study. Um, we're going to talk about some things that Brother Taylor says in here that we have better understanding of now. Uh, but this is a very, very good book and highly recommended. Um, as we begin this study, I'd like to read just the first few sentences that he has in his introduction. The Bible doctrine of the Holy Spirit. What a fascinating, fundamental, and foundational study is now before us. It is a study both challenging and consoling, both interesting and intriguing, both controversial and complex, both, both marvelous and militant. Minds brilliant and minds not so brilliant have grappled with the seriousness and sublimity of this glorious being of such august demeanor. This study is begun with all and will continue and conclude with a rising crescendo of even greater awe. That's A-W-E, not A-L-L. -L. Such is the noble nature of the study of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In 1938, Brother H. Leo Bowles delivered a series of lectures at Freed Hardin College on the subject of the Holy Spirit. There was such interest in his lectures, he was encouraged to publish them in written format. In 1942, the Gospel Advocate published this book, The Holy Spirit, His Personality, His Nature, and His Works. Uh, it's been reprinted a number of times. Very good book. Uh, I like the way Brother Taylor lays it out better. But they're both sound materials. And if you have room in your library for more than one Holy Spirit book, I recommend this is the second one. There are a number of books uh, that have been published in the past 80, 90 years that are very, very beneficial to the study of the third person of the God. Brother Bowles, in his book on page 14, he said, a plea is here made, not that God should receive less em emphasis, nor that Christ should not be made as prominent in Christian thinking, but that the Holy Spirit should receive due emphasis in the revelation of God to man and be brought out of the fog and obscurity into the sunlight of Bible truth as revealed in the book of God. Fog and and obscurity. We don't study the Holy Spirit enough. The New Testament talks about him a lot. We need to have a better understanding of who he is and what he does. What he did in the first century and what he does for us today. Since Brother Bowles' book has been published, there's been a, a plethora, there's that word, <laughs> of other books that have been published by good men, sound men. I've got all of these in my library. This is actually my picture. Uh, Gus Nichols, Lectures on the Holy Spirit. I don't agree with Gus Nichols on, on his view of the indwelling of the Spirit. Uh, but he's a good sound man. He's a scholarly man. And so there is room for disagreement without getting into the realm of error. And so what we're going to do is, is study this to that, to, together for the next several months and, and see if we can come to a, a conclusion about what the Bible says about the third person of the God. Uh, James D. Bales wrote some books. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Franklin Camp. I've lost it. Here it is. Franklin Camp. Uh, the Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption. This is a very good book. I believe it's in paperback now. Um, so it's probably a little bit cheaper. <laughs> Published in 1972. Okay. So 50 years old. Another very, very good book. 
highly recommended by me, uh, the Fort Worth Lectures. I believe it was in 1980. The subject of the lectureship was what do you know about the Holy Spirit? Wendell Winkler was the editor of that. Brother Taylor, uh, I believe Brother Nichols, uh, Roy Deaver, several sound men were involved in this lectureship. Uh, Mac Deaver and Marion Fox held a debate on the indwelling of the Spirit. I, I'm young enough that I remember hearing the stories about Gus Nichols and Guyan Woods in their debates that they held with each other at the Open Forum at Free Hardman uh, during the lectures and how they would argue vehemently against each other and then they'd go out and have lunch together, laughing and smiling. So we can disagree on things and not sever fellowship. And I think that's, that's important that we keep that spirit of, of disagreement in mind as we study this. Because I'm probably going to say some things that you disagree with. But hopefully we don't go beyond what the scriptures reveal. Uh, Brother Fox also published a book in, I believe it was in the 1990s, called The Work of the Holy Spirit, Volume 1. There is a Volume 2 out there. I don't have it yet. Um, it is a very deep work. Uh, it, it's over my head a lot of times. He refers to Greek and Aorist principles, and that, I'm just making stuff up now because I don't know what he's saying half the time. Uh, but he is such a scholarly person. It's a good book, and, and when I can break it down to a way that I can understand it, I agree with him. Uh, but there's a lot of books out there now that have been published in the past 80, 90 years since Brother Bowles' book has come out. Uh, you have a list. I, I gave you this several weeks ago. The front says the Bible Doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The back says recommended resources. Uh, if you're able to obtain these books, they're good books. Um, the one that we will be focusing on the most, however, is Brother Taylor's book, and that is the work of uh, the Bible doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at some scriptural designations of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is ruach. Uh, transliterated, it is R-U-A-C-H. I don't know what those Hebrew characters are. I copied and pasted that. Off of blueletterbible.org, a great resource. It's free to everyone. Um, it is used a number of times in the Old Testament. On your outline, you have this list along with the scripture references. Uh, we have Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where he's called the Spirit of God. Genesis 6 3, where he's called my Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord, Judges 6, 34, and 2 Samuel 23, 2. Your good spirit, Nehemiah 9, 20. Your spirit in your prophets, Nehemiah 9, 30. Your Holy Spirit, Psalm 51, 11. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord God, Isaiah 61, 1. His Holy Spirit, Isaiah 63, 11. And the Spirit, Ezekiel chapter 2. In verse 2, go through the Bible, and as you read the Old Testament, make note of where the word spirit is used. Now, in both the Old and the New, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, you have to notice the context, right? It was talking about your Holy Spirit. We know he's talking about the Holy Spirit. But there are times that that word spirit is used to talk about our attitude, our disposition, or the spirit that is within humans, the human spirit. So you have to look at the context to find out whether he's talking about the spirit, as in the Holy Spirit, or another type of spirit. Now, in most translations, that S will be capitalized if they believe it refers to deity. There are some instances where I disagree with translators and in whether they capitalize it or not. 
Um, you know, there are some times that I think he is talking about the human spirit and not the Holy Spirit, but they capitalize the S. So you have to take those things into consideration as well. When we turn over to the New Testament, the Greek word is pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. Again, that's uh, copied and pasted from blueletterbible.org. A uh, great website. Now, one of the things that Brother Taylor brings out, and this is going to be on page three of, of, the, of his book. I'll be reading from the last paragraph beginning at the first sentence. In the New Testament, he is called the Holy Ghost numerous times in the beloved King James Version. Ghost today does not mean what it did in 1611. And hence the older term in that version has given away, has given way to Holy Spirit, as in the American Standard Version and the New King James Bible. Now, is it true that sometimes words change definitions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you read the New Testament, the King James Version, there are times where Paul tells us um, to, to be, and I, I, I should have looked this up before, beforehand. He uses the word conversation. Let's just go with that. Well, when we think about conversation, what do you think about? Oh, we're, yeah, we're talking back and forth with each other. That's not what conversation meant in 1611. In 1611, it meant behavior, yeah. your conduct. Let your conversation be without covetousness. That's like the word tongues in Acts. Yes. Where we're speaking in tongues, and that's led to a lot of... Right. The tongues. The, the, way, the way that the uh, Pentecostal groups have, have seized on that, not understanding that it simply means languages. And in the fact, in the occasion of Acts chapter two, it was just languages the apostles had never studied before. Mm -hmm. They were uneducated fishermen, Galileans. They don't know how to speak all of these other languages, uh, and so they recognized there was something going on. It was not some heavenly, unknown to man tongue that they were speaking in. So yes, words can change meaning over time. Now, Brother Taylor continues, and he says. Ghost in 1611 meant guest. It no longer has that connotation. I don't like disagreeing with Robert Taylor. But I'm disagreeing with Robert Taylor on this point. This has been something that has been brought out time and time again. Global Music included it in one of his books that ghost used to mean guest. What, it happen, what happens is we have similar root words that give us different words, does not make them synonymous. Host and hostile or hostile, those are two very different words, aren't they? But they have the same root. They're brought into the English language from the same family of words. Ghost and guest are similar. They have the same root. They're related to each other. They're not synonymous. Now, why was this um, thought to be the case? Or why was this taught for many years? I took a class on the Holy Spirit on the online Academy of Biblical Studies back when it began. Back in the early 2000s. And Brother Ron Cosby taught that class. I learned a lot in that class. He taught it a lot better than I could remember. And so I contacted him on Monday. I was like, I remember you talking about this, but I don't have my notes from 20 years ago still. <laughs> and so he sent me his notes. So here is what Brother Cosby says. What would cause students to use ghosts and guest interchangeably. Instead of synonyms, more than likely the idea is that the pagans thought that a spirit within another was a guest 
at times. Thus, the words may be used interchangeably without both having the same meaning. Guest was used interchangeably with ghost at times because many had the concept that a spirit was a guest. Though it is doubtful that the translators of the King James Version used the word ghost to mean guest, theologians wanted their theology in the Bible. So they picked up on the interchange of ghost and guest. John Wesley wrote in his notes on the whole Bible as a constant guest. Your bodies and souls shall be temples of the Holy Ghost dwelling in you. Uh, another writer, A.M.A.N., uh, I'm not familiar with him. I don't know his religious uh, leanings. He said, such is the life and only the life that is constantly indwelt by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> To maintain this indwelling heavenly guest, there is an inward meekness and quietness of trust, free from worldly anxiety and troublesome care. Brother Cos Cosby concludes that it is a stretch to say the word ghost had the essential meaning of our modern guest, which is what Rubel Shelley affirmed. He also said that Rubel Shelley affirmed that the original idea inherit, inherent in the term Holy Ghost is Holy Guest. That's a stretch. That's incorrect. Uh, thus, the following statement from Brother Music that Brother Cosby presented in one class, and he came back and corrected himself. We have preferred not to use the term Holy Ghost because in 1611, when the King James was translated, it meant holy guest. Brother Music was wrong. Is that grievous uh, error that's going to condemn him to, to a lost state in eternity? I don't believe so. That's not something that necessarily affects our salvation. Misunderstanding a word or the etymology of a word does not affect our salvation. But the better we understand it, the better we can tackle the subject of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which will be several lessons down the road, not tonight. We'll touch on it a couple of times tonight, but we're not going to get into the, into the nitty-gritty of it. So in 1611, ghost did not mean guest. So you might want to make a note in your copy of Brother Taylor's book uh, to indicate that that is not a correct statement. Okay? All right. Like I said, we have to use context clues to, to determine whether man's spirit or the Holy Spirit or some other meaning of the word spirit is meant as we are reading. And then point number four, we have several designations of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, the Spirit of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit. Matthew 10, 20, the Spirit of your Father. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, the Holy Spirit. So on and so forth. The Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit, Holy Spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit of God, the eternal Spirit, and the seven spirits of God. Let's talk about that one just for a second. What is the scripture reference for the seven spirits of God? Where is that found? In Revelation. It's in Revelation, isn't it? What do we have to do when we study Revelation? Realize that it's figurative language. Figurative language. He does not mean there are literally seven Holy Spirits. Okay? There is one Holy Spirit. Just as there is one God the Father, one God the Son. There is one God the Spirit. Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 4 makes that clear. Okay? Revelation. The number 7 signifies completeness. Mm -hmm. Signifies perfection. The seven spirits. The complete, the perfect Holy Spirit. So, 
take, keep that in mind as you read through Revelation, anything in Revelation. You've got to look at the context of it because it's going to be figured most of the time. Okay? There's very little in Revelation that is literal. So we, we really have to take that in, into consideration. Yes. Now, I had three years of Greek at KCC. I didn't learn a lot of Greek. Okay. And actually, Paul Holland from the Paris Church mm -hmm. taught a class on it. And I'm wondering, I wrote this down, if, if in the Greek, and you know you can actually learn to recognize this, if every time the Holy Spirit is referred to, if there's an article V as opposed to just Spirit, so the seven spirits of God, there would be no article V in front of it. Mm -hmm. But if there is an article, I'd be interested in something to Google it or okay. whatever. Actually, you can email Paul Holland. Sometimes yeah. he's gracious to answer it. So if, if, if that were to follow through, then um, it might make a difference when you're trying mm -hmm. to discern, is this talking about the context? Yeah. Our spirit, right. Right? we each one. Right, but anyhow, yeah, that something to look up. That's interesting. I, I had not given that any thought, but that's a possibility. That that would be something interesting to look for. I'll do that for homework. Okay, all right. Uh, Brother Taylor says that there are less names given the Holy Spirit than for God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. It is said that there are some two hundred names given to Christ in the Holy Writ. Uh, Isaiah chapter nine verse six gives. A plethora. Can I use the word again? Am I allowed to use it twice in the class? Uses a plethora of different names for Jesus in that prophecy, Isaiah 9, 6. Um, nearly not so many are given of the Holy Spirit. The names we have of the third person describe his eternality, his person, his mission, his immaculate nature, his association with fellow members of the Godhead, and his link with humanity. On pages four and five, Brother Taylor gives us an outline that we're going to take uh, a, a look at over the next several months. These are the chapters in the book. And we'll look at uh, the Godhead, one or three. We'll look at the Holy Spirit in dual creation. We'll look at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in more detail than what we've done tonight. I'm going to look at the points to ponder on page 5. Because if a man of, of Brother Taylor's in, intellect says this is something that we should think about, this is something we should think about. So these points to ponder. Number one, the Holy Spirit is eminently worthy of our serious study. Uh, number two, sound and solid men need to be leading the way in the study of the Holy Spirit. Number three, there is no justification for all the misconception relative to the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about some misconceptions in just a moment and, and look at a few of some of the more common ones. Number four, the Bible must be our only standard of religious authority. I can think a lot of things and I can feel a lot of things, but if I can't back it up with what God says does what I think and what I feel really matter. So we need to use the Bible as our standard. Number five, all we know about the Holy Spirit comes from this book, the Bible. That's all we know. He hasn't revealed anything else to us outside of this about himself. About his personality, his nature, his mission, his work. So we need to look in the Bible to see what God has revealed about himself, what the Spirit has revealed about himself. All right? Any questions or comments before we move on to the next slide? All right. Now... Okay, I was pretty sure I was going to get through two tonight. That's, that's why I went ahead and prepared the first two chapters. Misconceptions of the Holy Spirit. Misconceptions 
starting on page 8. Misconceptions abound toward every biblical fundamental in both testaments. The Godhead is no exception to this true assessment. God is misunderstood. Jesus Christ is misunderstood. The Holy Spirit is misunderstood. H. Leo Bowles used to preach on the topic, the misunderstood Christ. Mis misconceptions, misapprehension, misunderstandings really abound more, I believe, towards the third person of the Godhead than the first and second. Many who call themselves Christians, most who call themselves Christians, would say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There are some exceptions to that. But the majority will affirm that he is the Son, capital S, Son of God. They will affirm that God the Father is Almighty. They will affirm that the Father and the Son are eternal. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, you can get a lot of different answers to those same questions. There's a lot of misconceptions about him. Lynn and I were talking just a few moments ago. Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not call the Holy Spirit him. They call the Holy Spirit an it. It's just a force. It's just a, a and we'll talk about this in a minute. When we get to the second point, we need to get out of the habit and I catch myself doing it sometimes. Because we don't talk about him enough, I think is what, where it comes from, where that problem comes from. We need to get out of the habit of calling the Holy Spirit it. We need to get out of the habit of calling the church the building. We need to get out of these habits that are propagated and are, are uh, uh, popularized by the denominational world and use Bible things. Call Bible things by Bible names. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, I think back when I was younger, we didn't study the Holy Spirit very much. And I think it was because it, there was so much false doctrine about it. Instead of us digging in there and finding it, we just stayed away from it. Right, right. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Those are the two that you don't want to study. You don't want to touch. If you're a preacher, you don't want to touch with the 10-foot pole those subjects because there's just too much to unpack. Mm -hmm. There's too much error to unteach. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> we've, we've got to get into what the Bible reveals mm -hmm. and stick with that. Lynn? The number of the, the, the believers, congregation I grew up, I, I distinctly remember, and my wife remembers this also, although she, her sister went there. She lived in Ohio, and this is in Kentucky, up from Maysville. There, there seemed to be a understanding that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God were synonymous. A very interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll get into that in several weeks. Uh, when we get into the, the indwelling, that there's going to be a distinction made between the Spirit and the Spirit. And the product, the word, the product of the spirit and how he uses the word. OK, so we will get to that. Not tonight. All right. Misconception number one. There's a lot of misconceptions about his spiritual nature. John chapter four, verse 24. God is spirit. Capital S in most of your Bibles, most of your translations. As it should be, because it's referring to deity. God is spirit, and they who worship him must worship in spirit and the truth. They're talking about the Father there. That's who Jesus has reference to. But God is a spiritual being. The Father is a spiritual being. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, Paul says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, yeah, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory 
to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. In the context there, I believe he's talking about Jesus. That is Jesus. Jesus is a spiritual being. The Holy Spirit is a spiritual being. He's referred to in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 in the Hebrew term Elohim. That is a plural term. The Father, the Son, the Spirit are all there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Right? So we see, again, the spiritual nature. Now, some of this misconception is due to us calling him the Holy Spirit. That's the way the Bible identifies him. We can picture God the Father. Well, you know, I've got a dad. We can picture God the Son because he did come in the flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1, verse 14. But can we picture the Spirit? In our human finite minds, that's a little bit harder to wrap our minds around that concept. And so part of this difficulty comes from the fact that he is a spirit and that we don't really have a physical thing that we can connect with there. Whereas the father is the father. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the son of God. He is our brother. You know, we can still connect to those things that we can't connect to the spirit. Lynn? Oh, I, I thought you were raising your hand. That's okay. That's okay. All right, so we have all spiritual beings here. I'm going to refer again to H. Leo Bowles on page 14. In his book, there has clustered around this member of the Godhead, the Spirit, so many superstitions and traditions that people know very little of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. So we have to study what the Bible reveals, don't we? Mm -hmm. We have to see what he says. All right, misconceptions concerning his existence as a divine person. He is not simply an influence. He is not the force from Star Wars, <laughs> right? It's not, it, it, it's not... Uh, <laughs> Let me just continue on. He's not a glorified it, as the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Um, the, the Spirit is a person, personality. Um, sometimes we have trouble wrapping our heads around this because they are spiritual in nature. But they also have the divine person, personal nature too. Um, there are a couple and we were talking about this also before we hit record so I'll mention it here there are a couple of verses in the King James Version that do refer to the spirit itself Romans chapter 8 verses 16 and 26 this is corrected in the American Standard Version and the New King James Version it, it is re rendered there the spirit himself as it should be Misguided religion, religionists deem him to be a liquid that can be poured out of heaven and received into a zealous vessel of eager humanity. The pouring out of the Spirit, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, a misunderstanding of figurative language to help our human minds understand and they take it and try to put literal meaning to it. He is not a divine fluid. He is not a liquid. Uh, he is not an impersonal energy. He is not a cosmic force. Those are all quotes from Mormon uh, theology, from Mormon texts. Uh, not the Book of Mormon, but from their books that teach their doctrine. 
So we need to be very careful when we approach the subject of the Holy Spirit. Another Mormon teaching is that he is in a class with magnetism or electricity. He's not. The Spirit is God. Just as much as the Father is God, just as much as the Son is God. They are three, they are one. Uh, among those with far more zeal and knowledge, I'm sorry, far more zeal than knowledge, can be found affirmations uh, that he is electricity that changes people, that charges them up in whom he enters. This is the Mormon quote again. The Holy Spirit is in a class with magnetism or electricity. It's a misunderstanding of the Spirit. It leads to emotionalism. It leads to things that are not based on Scripture. You can't back up what you're doing with Scripture. If you can't back it up with the Bible, we need to stop doing it. Okay? Misconceptions about how he influences man. He does not speak directly to man today. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 talks about God who in sundry times and diverse manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken to us through his son, by his son. And then as we go on through the New Testament after the son ascended back to the Father after the crucifixion and resurrection, what happened? He sent the Spirit of Truth to His apostles mm -hmm. to call to their remembrance all things that He had said. He wasn't creating new doctrine with the apostles. He was reminding them what Jesus had taught them. So the Holy Spirit does not speak directly to man today, though He did in the first century. Well, I was thinking of when they were all arguing about the spiritual gifts in in Corinthians, yeah. and he said that when that which is perfect comes, right. that'll all be done away with. So. Yeah, First Corinthians thirteen verses uh, eight through thirteen talks about um, you know we prophesy in part, mm -hmm. we know a little bit, but but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part, the prophecy, the knowledge, that's all going to go away. Mm -hmm. The miraculous knowledge we're going to have. The perfect, James 1.25, law of liberty, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need the miraculous confirmation anymore. Such a claim that he does influence man directly flies in the face of the all-sufficiency of the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures, which are inspired by the Spirit, holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. That's what Peter says. I can't remember the verse off the top of my head, but just... I'll pull the Marshall Keeble quote out. Just read the epistles of Peter. You'll run into it. <laughs> All scripture is profitable for teaching. So why do we need the Holy Spirit to teach us something new or different? All scripture is profitable for reproof. So why do we need the Holy Spirit to correct us from the wrong? All scripture is profitable to make the man of God complete. He is not going to do something he does not need to do. We have the word to make us complete. We have the word that we can look into for the information of how to be saved. James 121, the word is able to save your souls. We need to turn to the word. We need to trust in God who gave us the word. Now, why is this so important? Why is this particular point so important? Because you will hear people say the Holy Spirit talked to me. The, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit told me to do this. Yeah. 
The Holy Spirit laid this on my heart. The Holy Spirit led me. Only if you read it in the Word and you decided to obey it. That's how the Holy Spirit leads us. The Spirit and the Word are not the same, but the Spirit uses the Word to influence us. He does not influence directly our heart. Another book that was published in 2000, no, 1998, but I haven't read it probably in 20 years. Curtis A. Capes, who was a director of Memphis School of Preaching for a while, does the Holy Spirit operate directly upon the heart of a saint, the Christian? Because we will deny all day that he operates directly on the heart of the sinner, which is Calvinistic theory. Irresistible grace, right? The eye in tulip. But what about the Christian? Does he influence the Christian directly? So Brother Cates refutes that. He has a review of neo-Calvinism among the Lord's people. New Calvinism. Reformed Calvinism, if you want to call it that. We're taking these Calvinistic ideas, and we don't want to disagree too much with our religious neighbors, so we'll deny this, but we'll allow this. But the Word doesn't allow either. And that's what we have to go by. What does the Bible say? So that's why the influence of the Spirit is important. All right. His past and present activity, his work in confirming the Word is complete. Mark chapter 16, when Jesus offers the Great Commission. And he tells his disciples, go and, and teach the world. Go and take the gospel to all nations. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. These signs will follow you, verse 17. And he listed a whole host of miraculous things. Verse 20, it says, they went everywhere preaching the word. And the Lord went with them confirming the word. That was the purpose in the first century of the miracles, of the things that he was doing. We've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, you can also look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 in reference to that. Everything must have a purpose. Brother Floyd L. Smith said this during the Fort, Fort Worth lectures. Everything must have a purpose when it comes to divine activity. God is not going to waste his energy doing something that's not necessary. Miracles today, such as in the early church, early days of the church, would have no purpose. We have the confirmed word of God. All right. Misconceptions concerning his indwelling. Very quickly, because we will go into more in-depth with this subject down the road a little bit. Uh, Brother Taylor said many contend for a literal, actual, personal, direct indwelling of the Spirit within the Christian. They will say that he does nothing separate and apart from the Word, but he's there. Uh, does a personal indwelling in which the Spirit does nothing separate and apart from the Word, does it accomplish anything? So we'll talk about that a little bit more. If you want to disagree with, with me about the personal indwelling, go ahead. That's what Guy and Woods and Gus Nichols disagreed on. I don't mind disagreement. All right, but we're going to study and see what the Bible teaches concerning indwelling. And finally, misconceptions concerning the study of the Holy Spirit. Subjective versus objective. What is the difference? What is subjective? Well, I feel like, I think subjective is not what we base faith on. Objective. That's what we need when we approach any study. But particularly for our purposes, the study of the Spirit. Facts must influence our feelings, not vice versa. Too many approach Bible study. Well, 
this is what I think, so I'm going to find how to prove it. That's not the way we should approach it. We should approach it as, this is what God says, so this is what I believe. This is what I feel based on the facts. Okay? Finally, the Bible would and could clear up a multitude of misconceptions if it were properly interpreted and correctly applied. This is going to be a long study. This is going to be an intense study. I urge you, if you haven't already, I know many of you have it on order, get a copy of this book. It will help us in keeping ourselves focused on the subjects at hand. If you have questions, write them down. I may not answer them right away. Because in the course of the study, it may come up later. And then at the end of the study, we'll say, okay, what did we not answer yet? And, and we'll look at some of the other questions that we might have, okay? So study this book, study the scriptures. Next week, we will begin talking about why should we study the whole Holy Spirit. And that will be our subject for next week. Thank you for your kind attention. We are dismissed.